We knew they were a great club, certainly. Uh, they're one of the oldest clubs, if not the oldest club in the Southeastern Conference. Their lineup doesn't have a freshman or a sophomore in it. And their, their kids have been through the wars. They've had good times and they've had bad times. And they, they are an experienced club that really knows how to execute, especially offensively. They're a very good defensive team. Um, and they have one of the better bullpens in the Southeastern Conference. So I, I, I think they're a really good club. Give them a lot of credit. I really don't believe we played as well as we wanted to. Overall, really pleased with how our kids have played in the first half uh, of the SEC season. We know they're a really good team. You know, we played them last year and they're really good. And they had, you know, I think almost every starter coming back this year. They're really a uh, really veteran, really experienced club. Um, you know, we knew they were hot. They came off the sweep of Georgia, I think. Um, we knew that they did go down to Florida and got swept there, but we, we knew that wasn't um, indicative of what kind of team they were at all. That they're a really strong offensive team with some some quality starters and some really, really power bullpen arms. And uh, we knew they were a good team coming in and we were going to have to compete hard. I thought Dakota pitched a great game. He, he threw a lot of strikes for us. And uh, you know, offensively, our, our plan at the plate uh, you know, was working. And, you know, I, I thought our team did a great job of, you know, just trying to take what we could and, you know, produce some runs. We didn't challenge the strike zone as much as we wanted to. We had a, a few more big misses than we needed to. But uh, I think it's a great growing experience for our club. You know, at times we have four freshmen on the field uh, at one time. So I think for those young guys to be playing against an older, more experienced group and, and to get that experience, you want to win every game. You want to compete your tail off. But at the same time, you want your kids to get better game by game by game. And uh, I, I really believe as we go through the second half, we're going to continue to get better. I mean, it was typical SEC Friday night. There were two really good pitchers going back and forth, and each team was kind of just scratching to get a few runs because that's what it takes on Fridays in the SEC. You know, I, had, I came up bases loaded, I think, um, and they had one of their better leaders in, in uh, Hendricks, and I knew he was power on while I was just looking for a fastball, and I was able to, I didn't really hit it that hard, but I was able to, you know, get enough bat on it to sneak it in there and got a big RBI. Um, I was proud of our team. We fought back. We competed hard late, and it just, it just wasn't enough at the end. On the pitch, and a high fly ball, deep right field, back near the wall, waiting for it is Brown. He's on the track and got it. The wind held it up a little bit as it's blowing in from right field, and Burke, who hit it pretty well, is out to him the inning. Low at first base in the pitch, and there's a ball hit high in the air, deep in the outfield, has a chance, back to the wall, gone, two-run homer. Humphreys gets the Bulldogs uncorked in the first. All three games, we kind of competed hard. Um, we got that we were down all three games. I know um, at some point during the game, but all three games, I was proud of our team. We fought back. We competed hard. We kept having quality at bats. Our pitchers keep com kept competing. We made plays defensively. Um, you know, it just ended up not being enough in all three games. But I thought we were we were resilient and we we never quit. We never gave in. We kept uh, fighting back. Kept battling back to the end of every single game. And uh, you know, that's the, that's the thing you look for to be a great team and to win championships at the end of the season. You got to have that never quit mentality and you got to keep going to the last outs made and I thought we did that all weekend. The pitch, swinging strike. Brown gets back-to-back -back strikeouts, one to end the fourth, one to start the fifth. Daniel Brown had an outstanding uh, outing this weekend, really proud of what he did and I, I believe he's going to be a factor for us in this second half. He's, he's somebody who has great stuff and when he challenges the strike zone. You know, I, I think he's an elite pitcher in the Southeastern Conference. Daniel Brown came in and just, just pitched great this weekend. He, he really, you know, shut down a very hot A&M team. Daniel threw really well. He threw, um, he had a really good inning against Memphis on uh, Wednesday, I think it was, and looked really good this past weekend as well. And, um, you know, that's the kind of Daniel we're used to seeing in the fall and in the spring scrimmages, and that's the kind of Daniel he was in the Cape last summer. And uh, for us to be as good as we can be, we're going to need him to step out there and compete like he did. Um, we're really happy with the way he performed, and I think he's going to keep that going throughout the rest of the season. It's going to give us a chance to win a lot of games. Andrew Vincent pitching to Jake Mangum, and a ground ball, headed for right field, another base hit. One run has scored, another runner headed for the plate, and he'll score. I thought I saw the ball well, you know, kept getting you know, some good pitches to hit. Um, you know, the plan at the plate you know, worked well, and um, you just got to be ready to go next game. I didn't feel like we played poorly in stretches. I think our kids kept competing. We just didn't handle some, some very fundamental things that, uh, that you got to handle to be able to compete against the best. And, 
every weekend in this league at Vanderbilt, at Florida, um, at, you know, with Ole Miss, uh, with the Texas A&M, you're playing against the best. And when you make mistakes, the other team's going to make you pay for it. And that's exactly what happened this weekend. Guys, everybody in here, tight, let's go. Hey, I know all of you guys know this, but this, the military guys are here, we're gonna honor them, and I want you guys to sincerely, every one of you, shake their hands and tell them how much you appreciate what they do for this country. So I wanna tell, tell you guys something. I have a little nephew who's in Afghanistan. He got blown out of a Humvee, and he still can't walk upright very well. And he did that for all of us. And so these guys, they put their lives on the line. I, that's serious stuff, and I want everybody here to appreciate that. When you're 18 to 22 years old, you, you really don't fully comprehend all of those people who have come before you and, and have sacrificed so much to give us everything in this country. And, and I want our kids to realize that. Um, and all of our kids come from great families, and that's been beaten into their heads. Uh, I'm sure, but at the same time, we want to keep reminding them about that. Uh, my, both my grandfathers fought in World War I, my father was in World War II, um, had uncles in Korea, so, you know, it, it really, it makes me feel like maybe I haven't done my part in terms of representing our country the same way my family has, but boy, do we have a deep appreciation for all those people and what they do. I've got family that's in the military. I'm sure a lot of guys on our team have family that's in the military or has been in the military. And to be able to show our appreciation um, to those guys is really, really important to us. You know, we take we take this game of baseball really seriously, but when you look at the big with the big scheme of things, um, there's people out there putting their lives on the line, doing things that are way more important, way more dangerous than what we're doing over here. So it's it's special for us to be able to thank those people and you know give them the honor that they deserve. Keep going. Dazzle three. One, two, three. Oh. Yes. Uh, Dwayne Burke, and he struck him out as he got a ball over the outside corner above the knees. And Burke strikes out swinging to Henley Unning. 1-1 one, one pitch. High off the middle of the catcher. That's going to score a run and end to score Stovall. The other two runners advance. Four hits in the four innings that he worked. Hard hit ball into left field, a base hit. Third hit of the ball game for Mangle. Hunter Stovall started the inning off in the bottom of the seventh of the mess of the right field. And the, their right fielder, you know, came in, dove, and caught it. And you know, it, that one hurt because if, if he gets on, you know, that's a three-run home run by Gavin, but uh, you know, I, I was able to get a high change up with two strikes and you know, sent it through six hole for a base hit. Gavin came up and you know, really changed the game for us right there. That, 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 that sparked us for sure. There's a drive, deep, way back, at the wall, might go, gone, two-run homer, and the dogs are back in it quickly as Gavin Collins just hit a, a ball that looked like it was elevated a little bit. He got all over the top of it, and he drilled it out of here to left field. Four to three, Texas A&M leading. Here's the pitch. There's a drive, right field, very deep in the corner. It is a fair ball. Rolls through the corner. Low trying to score. He's headed for the plate. Here comes a throw. It's not in time. Bulldogs have tied it up. And at third base is Rucker with a run scoring triple. You know, Rucker just continues to stay hot and hit the ball well. He, he got a triple right field, and that was, that was really big for us. He'd throw and read a bunch of sliders that had bat before me, so I was just trying to take those sliders and you know get a fastball, I could get a barrel on. And he made a pretty good pitch, honestly. It was um, outer half the plate, probably on the black, and I was able to just get a barrel on it, and it found a hole. Um, thankfully, it was the first time I felt like I found a hole all weekend. I feel like I've been hitting balls right at people, but um, you know, it fell right down the line. And then Nate was able to Nate's not the fastest guy on our team, but he was able to turn on the Jets and hustle around the bases, and uh, you know. Had a good slide there at home plate to tie it up, and um, you know I thought we got some momentum there. Eli had a really big double right after that to give us the lead, and uh, like I said, we fought back hard, we competed till the end. It just ended up not being enough, but like I saw, I keep saying this, but I'm proud of our team for the way we competed and the way we fought all weekend. 
Every single team in our league is going to have a weekend like this. And in 2013, I remember going to Vanderbilt. We got swept, and that was a pivotal moment for our club. We came back from that. Uh, we learned a lot, and we ended up getting on a roll in the second half and, and obviously, you know, getting to the, the championship game of the College World Series. So I think if you look at it as a positive and you get better from it and you work towards getting better every day, then it can be a positive. smart as Brent Rooker is, it's kind of hard to believe that he believes in aliens, but uh, to each his own. You're driving home from Memphis, late at night, you hear these two old dudes on the radio talking about Project Moon Dust, uh, which is basically the whole idea is a government cover-up. And you, uh, the man of learning you are, instead of saying these guys are crazy and changing the channel, you started listening and you're like, all right, there might be something here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've been. You no, know, like, I've just been kind of interested in all kind of conspiracies just for a while. I always read about them on the internet and articles and whatever I can find. And so I was coming back after Easter, I think it was. Um, I just I heard this radio show, these two guys talking about all kind of UFO sightings and cover-ups and conspiracies that I hadn't heard about. So, you know, I was kind of, didn't have any good music to listen to, so I figured, you know, might as well tune in and see what they got to say. And I listened to them for about an hour and a half. And they had some pretty interesting things to say, you know, made some pretty valid points, so then that kind of got me into it. I went home and read a little bit more, uh, you know, just got it started from there. To be a baseball player, it's such a mental game. Your brain has to operate on something of a, of a different level. There's so much failure involved that you got to have things that kind of get you, get, you, get you out of your own head so you can keep succeeding. What do you think the government's trying to hide? I think, first of all, the, the issue you have to address isn't the existence of UFOs. I think that's, um, you know, the first thing you gotta say is they're real. There have been plenty of sightings. There's, I mean, thousands of sightings every year. Yeah, yeah. There's plenty of documentation, both videos, um, you know, and photographs of these things in the sky that no one can really identify. And so that's the first thing you have to do is kind of take away the, you know, the stigma of, hey, maybe these things aren't real, they're definitely real. And then you move into the fact of, you know, what are they, where do they come from, and what do we know about them? And I think the next fallacy that's out there is people think that the existence of UFOs and then the existence of, uh, like, little Martian-type creatures are the same thing. Do I believe in aliens? Um... I actually do not believe in aliens. I, I think uh, it's, it's 2016. I, I think if there was anything up there, we would know by now. Uh, you know, if, <laughs> I just... If all of this uh, is real, if, if there is technology we are unaware of, if there are craft that can go into space, that can stop on a dime, that can move without sound, is the public ready for all that? I don't know. That, you know. That's the big question. Is there's there's so much conflict, um, you know, in the world already between, you know, what you have going on in the Middle East and our involvement in it. Is what kind of impact would this have on those type of situations if this information technology is released? And then you got to ask who has it. You know, is it just the United States that has it? Is it the United States and Russia maybe has it? Are there any, you know, what does North Korea have? Are there any other countries in the Middle East that might have similar technology? and what that would do to kind of change the face of, of you know, the global situation of how it is now. We're on our way. Uh, Mississippi State has the Howell Observatory. I don't know if you're familiar. I don't think either of us have been out there before. It's um, supposed to be pretty cool. Uh, they do a lot of public viewings at nights, look into space. Uh, and you know, you and I were actually talking about recently huge discoveries in terms of astrophysics. Uh, they confirm the existence of gravitational waves. If these gravitational waves 
you know, do what, what we think they do, and essentially what it is is two black holes collapsing into each other and creating kind of a ripple in the space-time continuum, giving you the ability to travel, you know, further distances in less amount of time by kind of skipping through space. I, I can honestly say that I don't believe in aliens, but I do know that my wife and my children watch all of those shows that involve the, uh, you know, the Walking Dead and things of that nature. The, 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 and I know that's not alien stuff, although I don't know, maybe it could be. I've never watched an episode, but. You think, uh, you think aliens are real? I don't know. Um, I, I, I mean, obviously, I don't, I don't know either. Know. I don't know. I've read a lot. Um, but you know, we don't have any hard evidence that we know of, of a body or an actual yeah. crashed ship that we could confirm came from, you know, somewhere that wasn't Earth. Yeah. But I mean, I don't rule out the possibility, uh, but I don't have enough information on the subject to make a claim one way or another. By the way, that, uh, that cow is smelling real good. Yeah. Whatever it is they got cooking out here, that's, uh, that's a nice smell. If you watch any movie like Independence Day or Pacific Rim, it, it's always the aliens are coming to kill us. Right, yeah, they could be nice. They yeah, could be yeah, like, or, or here's the thing, what if we're the most advanced species in the universe? Well, then it's all on us to go out and explore, you know? Well, maybe this, uh, the telescope out here will give us a minor glimpse. Yeah, I'm excited about it. I don't think we're going to find any aliens, if I had to guess. Leading, you know, teaching the public, educating them. We're getting set for um, some other cool opportunities, like uh, we're already planning for 2017. August 21st, 2017, we're going to have a 95% totality uh, solar eclipse going right over the university. You know, we're talking UFOs specifically. Okay. You know, unidentified okay. flying objects, not little green men from Mars, but just in, in terms of that, does that excite you? I mean, how much are people yeah, actually, talking about that? Yeah, actually. It, it does excite me, and I'm not the only one in the department, actually. So it's not a taboo topic? No, it's not. If you, if you start talking about, you know, little green men and UFOs, you know, around Mars, people will think, okay, that's, that's not, <laughs> that's not going to happen. But life outside of, you know, outside of Earth, you know, there's a lot of things going on with that, actually. Um, one of our professors, the director for the observatory, she does research on extrasolar planets looking for habitable life. So she's looking way out in the universe, looking for these planets just like Earth. And so there's, it's a valid thing, and people are doing it. And I mean, when you think about it, you know, we, we're not even sure if there's life, in, other life inside of our solar system. We're looking at Saturn, and on Saturn there's this, uh, there's this moon, Europa, that has um, liquid water below its ice. So it has, it has layers a couple miles deep of ice. Below that there's liquid water. If there's liquid water, there could be life. Because that's, basically that's the biggest thing that we need for life. So we're not even sure if there's life, other life in our solar system. We can't say that there's not life out in the universe. Think about a major change at this point? I don't think so. Oh, this kind of goes over my head a little bit. I'll stick with my, <laughs> my business administration stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. I dig it. Well, cool. Man, I uh, appreciate you letting us talk with you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, we've enjoyed it. And then, you know, you got B.O.B. still behind the times a little bit. If you didn't see that, the rapper. Oh, what do you have to Oh, say? he's still making claims that the Earth is flat. And then, uh, really? That seems not smart of him. Right. And then uh, NASA is just a cover up of. Or NASA's trying to cover up that fact. Uh, oh, through, what? Through, what? through uh, editing pictures of Earth to make it look round and not like it's flat like it actually is. What does he think NASA has to gain by telling us uh, I'm not sure. Is... I didn't get that far into it. But uh, yeah, it's, that's where he stands on the issue. He is a disgrace to my name. <laughs> I don't think horses think about this stuff. No, they don't. Where do I get my next food? With my sleep. <laughs> <laughs>